Hello and welcome to what should be the final part of my van rewiring project, putting in a massive lithium battery and a bigger inverter and rejigging things generally with an induction hob and all that. At the end of the last part I was umming and ahhing about how to arrange all the bits in the cabinets of the van and I asked for your suggestions and there were many, many suggestions. I'm going to show you now what I've done and explain my reasoning. There were a few people who said I should completely redo this left-hand electronics cabinet. That would be an utter, utter waste of time, I think. I do not agree at all, because everything in here is where it needs to be. You've got the feed coming in down there from the shoreline connection. You've got the consumer unit. That is a different consumer unit, but the consumer unit was always in here. The solar charger was in here. Um, the battery charger was in here, although I have moved it. But all the bits in here are needed to stay in here, and you've got the switch gear, and you've got the 12 volts um, fuses around here somewhere. So I wasn't going to move any of those. Someone said, oh, you need to put shielding on the, um, you know, heat shrink wrap over these connections in case anything falls on them. But this, this does not live like that. It has a front on it and a lid on it. So there's a cover over there and a, and a front on it there. So it's not all open and exposed. So nothing can ever fall on those connections. And in the five years I've had the van, nothing ever has. So I'm not too worried about that. Anyway, what have I done here? Well, the solar charge controller, you may recall, was here. What you may not notice is it's moved over to the right by about one centimetre because it was just slightly in the way for me putting in the new consumer unit. The old consumer unit was here and was single pole. This is the new one, which is double pole. And I just thought it's better if it goes like that. And you can see the switches and the door opens that way. And it's just better rather than it facing out this way, which is just a little bit harder to see. But in order to put it there, I had to move the solar controller over by a centimetre, but that's fine. And what it's got at the bottom is there's a feed down there coming up from the shoreline connection, which goes into there. And then you've got an output from there to the charger and another one to one of the main sockets. The charger, I was going to have it along the bottom here, which is where the old tiny inverter was. But I used that charger in the house to give the lithium battery its first charge. And it got pretty warm, and I thought it's going to prefer being upright, because a lot of the heat was coming off the bottom of it and the top of it, and I thought, let's make it upright, and any heat can come up that way, um, rather than building up um, if, it's, if it's lying flat. I thought it would be better. So that's down there. Now you'll notice that is just, just at the point where, ooh, I can open that above it. Of course, when I did it first, it was about half a centimetre higher than that, and I couldn't. I realised suddenly, oh damn it, I can't open that thing. So that had to go down by a fraction. But there we go, solar charge controller, mains consumer unit, um, that's an RCD and uh, two MCBs, GFCIs in uh, American terminology for the RCD, and the little mains charger unit. What about then? I hear you asking, the battery and the inverter, when I was very much umming and ahhing about where to put them. Well, eventually I put them both in here. I did manage, as you can see, to get the battery in where the old one was by taking out the old divider. And it's a little bit awkward to get into that space. You have to lower it down at an angle. And then I've secured it with some bits of wood at the bottom that stop it shuffling around. And then the inverter, which is this, I was thinking of having it in that compartment, at the bottom and boxed in, but in fact it goes quite nicely here. And various people have said, oh, your insurance is going to be invalid, oh, you're going to set the van on fire, oh, the inverter's going to need lots of cooling. Now, don't get me wrong, I accept that the inverter needs lots of cooling, but it's only going to run for about 10 minutes at a time, when I want to either boil the travel kettle or use the induction hob to warm up some suit. So it's never going to be running and running and running. Secondly, it has overheat protection built in, so if it does get too hot, it will switch itself off. Thirdly, the instruction manual, a lot of people seem to think I hadn't read the instruction manual. No, it says have five centimetres clearance around the sides and the top. Five centimetres, two inches, it's not a huge amount, and it has got five centimetres clearance all around it. I'll show you that in a second. And furthermore, there is ventilation coming in to this box because this is not a completely sealed box that the inverter is just going to be sitting in where it can't bring any air in. And I've also added vents. So honestly, I think it's going to be fine. And my insurance company, I looked through the policy, there's nothing actually about what you do in your camper van at all. So provided everything is installed per the instructions, five centimetres clearance, it's all fine. And also, 
any time that inverter's running, I'm going to be sitting here, so I'm going to know if there's something wrong. There is, though it may not look it, but trust me there is, I've measured it. Five centimetres air clearance here, and by the way, this is where the fans are, and I checked with Renergy, and the fans suck air in, and then they blow it out at the other end. So there's five centimetres clearance here, there is five centimetres clearance there, only just, but there is five centimetres clearance there. There is slightly less than five centimetres down at the bottom, um, but then the hot air will rise, so I'm not too worried about that. There's plenty of clearance above the thing for hot air to rise. Equally, that's about an inch and a half. But again, normally this thing would be laid flat, so you'd have a, a couple of inches above it before any obstruction. Well, above it is this way, because the heat will rise, and there's way, way, way loads of space here. So I'm not concerned about that. Now you'll have noticed, as I indicated there, I've put in a vent there. Remember, the fans are blowing the hot air out here, so there's now a vent there, so it can vent into the other um, compartment there. And also, I've put one there, so any air can come in there as well. And that is there, so it can blow air in there. Now, what about bringing some cool air in for the fans? Well, as I said, this is not an enclosed compartment. The, the back there is completely open. And what you've got down there it's not really very visible, but that is behind all the seats. That's the metal bit of the old bulkhead. But there's a big long run behind all the seats there, which is quite cool. And then, again, you can't really see it, but down there, that is between that bit of bulkhead and the seats, and that goes to underneath the seats and the whole front compartment. There's basically, what I'm saying is there's lots of cooler air can come into this whole box from this direction and be sucked in by the fans here and then they can blow out that way and the hot air can escape here and also here. So all should be well. I am willing to be proved wrong and I will eat my hat, not literally, if in fact it turns out to be a problem. But we'll run it, we'll see what happens, I'll take some temperature measurements, we'll see if it switches off, I'll keep boiling the kettle, I'll run the induction hob on its maximum setting on both hobs for 20-30 minutes, which is way more than I'd ever use it, and we'll see how hot it gets. The one thing you will have noticed from all this is that it's not actually connected up yet, and that is what I'm about to do. It is now a few days later. I needed a few days because I realised I needed to order some bits, which having ordered them and fitted them, I then realised I didn't actually need to order some of those bits, but what I did need to do was order some other bits, which I now have on order, which should be arriving tomorrow. Despite all that, the wiring is, by and large, done. So let me show you the tour. First things first, you'll notice that I have the cut-off switch here. And you may be thinking, hang on a moment, weren't you going to put that on the outside and isn't that almost exactly where it was before? No, not quite. It was where those black wires are going in and on the other side of the wood, which meant that I had to take the top off that seat and reach down in, ar in around it, in down here, to get to the switch. And that was a pain. Whereas if it's here, all I ever need to do is just pull that front off, which is magnetic, and then I can reach in and instantly get to the master switch, which as you can see is currently off, and you just twist it round and it turns everything on. So that's good. In here, I think I'll just point at some things. Positive battery terminal, big thick chunky lead coming off that to what you can't see there is a 300 amp mega fuse, which then comes out of that to the top of the switch. There's the other switch terminal, one part of which goes straight round to feed the inverter, and the other side goes off to a positive bus bar, which then goes off to the individual bits of the camper van through their own individual fuses and switches in there. Uh, yeah, that's all the red side, isn't it? Now on the negative side, there's the negative terminal. You've got the chassis ground, because the battery should be ground to chassis. I can't remember why, but that's something you do. And then you've got the main negative comes off there to the side of the shunt. The shunt is the thing that gives you the readout of how much battery time you have left. Um, from the shunt off to the negative bus bar, and from there off to all the things, the chargers and the um, appliances in the van, and so on and so forth. Also, you'll notice one little red wire coming off the red terminal that is powering the shunt. However, that is going to change. 
I have so far turned the master switch, switched it on, and nothing went bang, and the appliances worked. The fridge worked, and the water pump worked, all the stuff in the van worked as it should, so it's all getting current, and that is fine. I got as far as switching the inverter on, but I haven't yet had a chance to actually test it running full whack, running the induction hob, so I'm going to do that in a moment. But one of the bits that I bought that I didn't actually need was that red um, positive bus bar because I wired it all up with everything going through that and then wondered why my solar charger wasn't showing any activity. Well, of course, because everything goes through the switch, if the switch is off, the solar charger couldn't feed any charge to the battery and that needs to be permanent. So, in fact, the solar charge wires, as they are now, as I've rewired them, need to be permanently wired to the battery so that if the solar is... Uh, got any sunshine on it, it can feed charge, irrespective of the setting of the master switch. So in fact, the only thing that bus bar is now doing is connecting the output of that switch straight through and round down to the appliances in the van and their own fuses. So in fact, that was a bit of a waste of time. I could have just made a cable which went from there up through and down to the appliances. But what I'm going to say is that that is future-proofing that I've got extra bus bar capacity there for the future. Yes, absolutely. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that this wire that goes to the shunt is going to be replaced. And that is because of the nature of the lithium battery. As you undoubtedly know, lithium batteries do not like being charged below zero degrees. And whilst the battery management system on some batteries will automatically stop them being charged below zero. It is unfortunate that on this one, the BMS doesn't do that. It would take a charge even if the battery was cold, and you don't want that to happen. Apparently, it can actually uh, muck up the internal chemistry of a lithium battery to the point where stuff starts growing inside the battery on the cells, and then it can all short circuit, and that is bad. Having said that, you can apparently put a bullet through a LifePo battery and it still won't go up in flames. But even so, you don't want to charge it below zero. So what you're relying on is the solar charge controller or your mains charger or whatever using its temperature sensor to know that it's too cold to charge the battery. Now, here's where it gets slightly annoying. The smart solar controller I've got from Victron has a temperature sensor within it and it's happy to use that temperature sensor for temperature compensation of the charging parameters. But it will not use that internal sensor for switching off when it's below zero. It insists on having an external temperature sensor just for that one function of realising that it's too cold to charge the battery. So although it looks like, and even in the Victron app it says, um, shut off below, in fact it's set to 5 degrees Celsius, that, if you read the manual, doesn't work unless you've set an external temperature sensor. And what is more, the smart solar doesn't have an input for an external temperature sensor. You have to have another Victron device which can accept a temperature sensor and then create what they call as a VE network over Bluetooth that will talk to the smart solar and say, it's too cold for you to be charging. Now, luckily, the shunt does accept a temperature sensor and it can send a VE network signal to the smart solar. But that means I need £30 worth of Victron temperature sensor, which is one of the bits I've ordered that's going to turn up tomorrow, and that will replace the wire that's currently feeding the power to the shunt, because the new one feeds power and a temperature reading of the battery. So that is the one improvement I would suggest to EcoTree, is that they could make their BMS have a little temperature sensor and switch off any charge coming into the battery if it's below zero, because at the moment you have to set that in whatever charger you are using. Shall we see how the inverter does powering the induction hob and the kettle? See how warm it gets? Right, I've turned the system power on and that 0.14 amp current drain you can see is the carbon... Uh, do I mean carbon monoxide? Yes, I think. It's one of the alarms anyway. Yes, it must be the... No, it's the old propane alarm, which may or may not detect carbon monoxide. I can't remember. Anyway, it's still plugged in, and that is what the 0.15 amp draw is. Let's switch the inverter on. Just as it used to be, the top socket 
is the one coming out of the inverter. And as you can see, I've now put the inverter control switch here. So, on. I heard a little switch in the device, and hopefully that's going to come on. It is showing green, you just can't see it in the daylight. And you can see that it's on because we're now drawing 1.17 amps, which is the standby current of the inverter. Over here I have my dual induction hob, saucepans with some water in them. Each hob is 800 watts. And I read that unlike most induction hobs, this one actually varies the power as you turn it on and, and change the power setting, rather than simply oscillating periods of full power and no power. Uh, right, how does this work? Staring at the cooktop, wondering why it's not coming on, and then realising actually it's the bottom of the two main sockets that is the one that comes out of the inverter. I have changed that appropriately. This is actually the first time I've used this, so... Is that on? I don't know, it's... Oh, has it got a little flashing light? What does that mean? Oh! Okay. Well, it's on, clearly. So that is one burner on full power. That's 800 watts. Yeah. Okay, that's 800 watts. We can clearly see we're pulling 62 amps from the battery. 817 watts being drawn, so that's all accurate. Now, for a realistic heating test, I should put the cover back on that, so I will. There we go. I've got my temperature readout gun with me, so we can see how warm the inverter gets in a bit. Definitely working, because the bottom of the pan is hot. The water merely tepid, but the bottom of the pan is hot. Shall we be bold and turn the other burner on? Let's do it. Right, that should now be 800, but 800, 1600 watts, and near enough, 1450 watts, 115 amps being drawn, no complaints yet from the inverter. I think what I'll do is let that run until either the water is boiling in both pans, or perhaps until 10 minutes has elapsed. I want to go gently to start with in these tests, and then we'll see how hot the inverter is, if any of the cables are hot, all that kind of thing. I'm quite impressed with how quickly this pot is starting to boil already. There's steam coming off the water, and it's only been a couple of minutes. I'm also interested to note the current there at 118 amps, because I spec'd everything. I think the cables are spec'd for 345 amps, the fuse is 300 amps, so everything is well, well, well within tolerance. And I've still got 500 watts capacity left on that inverter if I really wanted to push things. That is not enough to run my travel kettle, which is another kilowatt. Although I will test that in a minute. Perhaps I'll test one burner and the travel kettle. As that should take it up to 1800 watts. Oh no, that's interesting. It's all just shut itself off. We must have tripped something. Oh. 